Good afternoon. Thanks all. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to meet you all at Dreamforce again. Uh, my name is Arun. I'm a product manager on our analytics group. I've been with Salesforce for about six years now. And uh, today we have Valerie and Kotai from CenturyLink who will be showing us their amazing app they've built using the Report API. Uh, before we get started, here's your favorite slide. Uh, Dreamforce, um, safe harbor. Please don't make any purchasing decisions based on forward-looking products. Cool. So uh, what is the Report API? We launched the Report API um, at Dreamforce last year. And what it is, is fundamentally it's a new way of accessing your data. So similar to Sockwell and similar to the Objects API, the Report API now provides you a way uh, for you to access information that's stored in Salesforce to build new applications on force.com. And really the main power of the Report API is that it establishes a clear abstraction between the app and the data access. So what I mean by that is, um, let's say you've built a really amazing dashboard app that shows complex metrics and your business analyst is super happy. A week from now, they're going to come back and say, I would like the dashboard changed, maybe with uh, three different set of metrics, and then I want to show today's data instead of, say, the entire month's data, and maybe segmented by product line instead of by region. So what this immediately translates to is it's a change of request. Now you as a developer have to go in, customize your application, uh, make the SOQL changes, and then test, deploy, and then push it into production. Um, it's a lot of work for the developer, and for the end user, it also increases the amount of time it takes uh, for them to get the changes they want. But now with the report API, it doesn't have to be so. So now what you can do is you can build an application where your report is your data source, and you can basically tell the end user or the business analyst that the report, uh, say named as the sales report, is going to be the data source for the application. So if they want to look at different metrics, they want to look at a different time range, all they need to do is they can go in and modify the report by themselves. So the end users are empowered, and the developers now can focus on building more metadata-driven applications. So they don't have to deal with change requests. So that's the main power of the report API. Um, since we launched the report API last year, we've been getting a number of questions. Uh, so I thought we'll quickly go over the questions before we see uh, Kotai's awesome demo. Uh, so the first question is, uh, is the report API useful only for building animations and visualizations? This is only for a dashboard use case. Uh, definitely not. Uh, when we launched the report API at uh, Dreamforce last year, we did focus a lot on visualization-focused examples because they are very easy to grasp. But as you can see here, uh, one of our partners, the task group, actually built out a fairly sophisticated sales application uh, called DealMaker, and it's purely powered by Salesforce reports. So there's obviously a lot you can do with the report API, and our visualization examples was just a starting point. Uh, the second question we often get asked is, uh, I'm not a developer, or maybe I don't know how to use JavaScript and REST API. Can I still use the report API? Uh, you definitely can. We have a couple of uh, ready-to-go examples. So the first one is an app on labs, Salesforce Labs called uh, MyCharts. So you can go and download the app, install it, and you can right away see how you can build powerful apps with the report API, no coding required. Uh, the next one is we also have a bunch of uh, coding examples on GitHub. So these are Visual Force pages that you can easily copy-paste into your test environment, change the report IDs, and see how it works. Uh, third question, most importantly, is limits. Uh, limits are definitely something you need to think about as you're building your application and thinking about long-term architecture. Uh, we have two sets of limits in the report API. One is the data size, which is limited to 2,000 rows. And the second one is the number of times you can call the API, which is 1,900 per hour. Uh, one thing to do, remember, is 2,000 reports an hour is a fairly high limit if you're losing it for low-volume pages. So if you have, like, one cache dashboard everybody in your organization is looking at, this number is more than sufficient. But if you're going to build widgets that are going to be on, like, a case page, then you definitely need to think about the limits. And uh, this is one area we are actively working on to see how we uh, come up with more scalable limits. But in the meantime, definitely th think about it. 
Uh, the fourth one is Apex support. When we originally launched, we launched it as a REST API. And uh, we've been marketing it mainly as the report API. So the immediate assumption is, is there any Apex support for it? Uh, the good news is we have native Apex support. We have classes in place right in Apex, so you can run your reports, process your data, create workflows, and build really sophisticated applications. Um, on that note, I'd like to invite Valerie and Kotai from CenturyLink, and they'll be showing us the amazing app. Thanks. Thank you, Arun. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Valerie Kilzer. I'm a manager of reporting and analytics in the business solutions group at CenturyLink. I've been with the company for 23 years and spent the last four years working with Salesforce. A little bit about our company. CenturyLink is the third largest telecom company in the United States. We've got over $18 billion in annual revenue and we're number 150 on the Fortune 500 list. A couple fun facts about our company. We've got 55 global data centers and 430,000 miles of network fiber, which if you were to lay it out end to end would be the equivalent of 17 trips around the world. So there are a couple of areas of focus that we wanted to share with you today where the reporting API really helped us out. The first was around chatter adoption. Like many companies, we could see that Chatter was a powerful tool that could help our employees connect and share information. If you've seen the statistics, then you know that companies that use Chatter, on average, see a 36% improvement in employee productivity. In addition, they see 43% improvement in access to information. So those are some pretty powerful numbers. So if you're not using Chatter at your company, you might want to think about it. Our problem, again, was around um, low adoption. We had pockets of use, but for the most part, our employees still relied on email for the majority of their communication, and our leadership team barely used Chatter at all. So our program office came up with an initiative called Chatter Matters, and it was designed to get employees comfortable using Chatter to collaborate on deals and projects, to ask and answer questions, and also to highlight and promote significant deals that we won and share some of the excitement around some of those big wins. The second area where the API came in handy was around sales trend reporting. At CenturyLink, we really like metrics, and we particularly like to slice and dice our sales results across a variety of dimensions, including by region, by segment, by product, etc. And each of these various metrics each has its own target and these targets frequently need to be updated when we have changes in our business. What we needed was a way to measure our performance against these targets and across these different dimensions. So now Kota is going to come and talk to you about how she was able to leverage the reporting API to develop solutions for each of these business problems. Thank you, Valerie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a lead business intelligence analyst working in the business solutions reporting and analytics team at CenturyLink. I've been with CenturyLink for 11 years, and seven of those 11 years I worked as a software developer in IT and network organizations. And I've been using Salesforce reports and dashboards for the last three years. Before I jump into my demo, I would, I'd like to talk briefly about the reporting API. I don't touched on this, so I'll be really brief here. This gives you a programmatic access to your report data, and you can run it on all sorts of reports, like tabular reports, matrix reports, and summary reports. And you can choose to run them synchronously or asynchronously. And depending on whether you'd like to run them synchronously or asynchronously, you get different limits. And you don't have to get your report data as is. You can actually dynamically change the filters in your code to get a subset of the data. And you can also query the report to get its metadata. So now, what can you do with all this report data? You can integrate these reports into applications. You can create rich visualizations using third-party software. Or you can build custom dashboards. So I have two demos today. The first one touches on how we've integrated reports into an application. In the second one, I'll show you how we use reporting API to build a custom dashboard. So report to chatter is the first application. 
and Valerie touched on this, so dovetailing on what she talked about with the chatter adoption, report to chatter triggers a chatter post of the top performing reps every week. So it reads a whole bunch of reports, composes a message, and then with a the push of a button, you can post this message to chatter. Before I show you the demo, I'd like to give you a little background story. So the business came to us and asked us to build five reports, one for each of our strategic products. And these reports would show the opportunities that we have won in the last seven days for these products. And then they had gone in and assigned a person to come in every Monday morning, read these reports, compose a message, and post the message to Chatter as a VP of Sales Effectiveness. Now, that could get pretty tired and old pretty soon. So, and it, it can also be error prone. So we suggested, rather than having a person go in and read these reports, we would use a reporting API, read these reports, just like she would, and then compose a chatter message, and all she would have to do is come in Monday morning, push a button, and the message gets posted to chatter. They loved our idea, so we went ahead and built the application. So let's take a look at that application in our sandbox. So this is one of the reports that we built. It's the top opportunities one last seven days hosting one of our strategic products. And if you uh, look down here, it's very important to note that the business logic actually resides in the report. The code itself has absolutely no knowledge of the business logic. And this one happens to be a summary report, but it could be either summary or tabular report. It doesn't have to be a summary report. And then further down, if you look, you can see all the columns. And we have a strict formatting on the columns. So when we come in through the code to read this data, we know that opportunity owner is in the third column. The amounts in the fourth column and so on and so forth. And the report is sorted top down with the top seller uh, being the first record there. So you can see here the, the top opportunity was sold by Keith Schwartz to ABC Corporation for $20,000. And then if you go to the bottom of the report, all these reports would have a grand total, and you can see $112,000 of hosting dollars was sold in the last seven days. Now, this is how it looks on the Visual Force page. So we used reporting API, read these five different reports, and you can see the message from two of the reports. And you can see that exact same message that you saw in the hosting report down there. So you see that $112,000, you see the top seller, Keith Schwartz, to ABC Corporation for a total of $20,000. So now if we want to post this to Chatter, all we have to do is push that button, post to Chatter. Actually, before I do that, let me refresh this to see if we are still logged in. All right. So I'm going to push that button, wait for it to come back. There it is. And you see there's no message here. So I'm going to refresh the screen here. And there's your message. So that exact same message that you saw on the Visual Force page is now on this chat feed. So it's as simple as that. She comes on Monday morning, she pushes the button, and the top reps get kudos from the VP of Sales Effectiveness. So now let's take a look and see how we actually implemented this. So here are some code snippets. So Report to Chatter was built in the March, April timeframe after the winter 14 release and prior to the spring 14 release. So Salesforce came out with a REST-based reporting API in winter 14 and the, and the Apex-based reporting API in spring 14. So the Report to Chatter is actually using the REST-based reporting API. So if you're going to use the REST-based reporting API, the first thing that you would have to do is you have to establish an authenticated session using OAuth. So you see up there, uh, we are building an endpoint URL. And then if you, go, if you see further down, we are actually passing in the report ID, which is the hosting top ops report. And then you can choose to include details if you'd like. 
And then we're passing in the session ID of the user and then sending in the HTTP request to get back the HTTP response. And one thing to remember is that all requests and response are in JSON format. So that JS object that you see there, that's a class that we actually got from Arun's GitHub code examples. We copied it as is, and it works great for us. All it's doing is it's converting that JSON string into an object. So we all know it's so much more easier to read an object than it is to read a JSON string. And then once you get a handle to the report result, the next thing you want to do is get a handle to the fact map. So the way I look at it is that fact map is the heart of the response. It gives you access to the report details and aggregate information that's in your report. And Salesforce has a lot of documentation on how to decode the fact map. So here are some examples on how you would access the fact map. So if you want to get the grand total of the report, you would say get as object T bank T. So if you want to get the first record in the summary report, you can see that uh, over there. And that's get as object zero bank T. And the next example that you see there is a tabular report. And we know tabular reports are nothing but a bunch of rows. So you can see get rows. And then you get the first row because that one has the highest dollar amount. And then you want to get the fourth column, which is get three. And, the, and we talked about how these reports have a strict formatting. So we know that the fourth column has the amount field. So we get, so we get it from get three and then store it in the highest amount. Similarly, you can get the account and the owner objects. Um, and then you can weave all these together and form a chatter message. And this message that you see here is not the actual message that we're posting to Chatter. This one's the message that you saw on your Visual Four screen. So now to post this message to Chatter, we'd have to construct it differently. So you would use the Connect API namespace. And that text segment input that you see there, think of it as a fragments of strings that we constructed in the previous slide. So you would stick all those strings into that text segment input. And then the message body input would con contain your complete message. And if you want to add mention a particular user, you would use the mention segment input and pass in that user's ID into the mention segment ID and put that back into the message body input to, to for complete your message formation. And that button that you saw there, which is posting to chatter, all it's doing is it's calling this method which has got just four lines of code. So if you look at it, it's calling the post feed item, and it's passing in the feed type, the chatter group ID that you want to post this to, and your input, which is the message body. So it's as simple as that, just four lines of code. So quickly, the advantages are, it took one person less than a week to build and deploy this. All the business rules, reside in the report and not in the code. The first day we went into production, one of the business rules changed. All we did is change the report, and the data started flowing into the application. And what would have taken a person about an hour and a half every week to do, now it takes her just a few seconds to do. So very well received by the business. We're getting a lot of enhancements to this, and very excited about that. And the chatter group that this message is posted to, there are over 3,600 plus users. So sales trend report, this one's my next demo. And it, this one's a custom dashboard that we built using a reporting API. So Valerie talked about how we at CenturyLink like to slice and dice our data and put code on top of every single slice of data. So sales trend report really helps with that. The dashboard shows the year-to-date trending of sales. And for each month in the year, the dashboard also compares the sales numbers to Coda. And it's mobile. This one's a more restricted application. Very few sales leaders and a few people in operations have access to this. And we want them to be able to access this application through their tablets and phones. This one has the code itself is much more complicated than report to chatter. But um, it's um, pretty, it was really easy for us to build it. It took us about probably 1%, about three weeks to build and deploy it to production. 
So before I show you the sales trend report in our sandbox, I'd like to take you through the journey that we at CenturyLink have been through before we got to the sales trend report. So let's jump to our sandbox. So here's an example dashboard. So we have several of these dashboards in our production instance of Salesforce. And you can see those gauges up there, and they're really nice. They're pictorially, you can see how we are doing, and they're really great. Like the first chart says, gauge says we are at 114%, very clear, it's in green. But it doesn't tell you who's doing well and who's not doing well. So what we did is we, we built further components that looked like the ones down below where we're breaking it down by region. And you hover over those regions, you can see what the dollar amount is tied to those, bar, to those bars. But it still doesn't tell you which region is doing well. Just because a region is making more money, it doesn't mean that they're meeting their quota. So what we did is, So about two years ago, we built several dashboards that look like these. These are Visual Force pages with a custom Apex controller at the back end that's sprinkled with SQL queries. Every single number that you see on there is coming from a SQL statement. And it's so tedious because all the business rules reside in the SQL statement. But it's really a very nice dashboard because it shows you a master detail relationship. And you can see how the master is at 116%. And then you can see down below the region here, one is doing very well, but region two is not doing so well. So clearly, graphically, you can see with the color code how well it's, each region is doing. It's breaking it down by the various subcategories that are sales categories. And you can see how those categories are doing as well. But from a developer's perspective, it's very hard to maintain something like this. So switching back to the PowerPoint. So here's an example SQL query that's in the Apex controller. So you can see how complex some of these SQL queries are. And you can see how many business rules are embedded in the SQL query. So every time there's a change to the business rules, there's a reorg, we have to go in there and change these SQL queries. We have to wait for an IT release, and then we have to deploy this into production, and we have to retest all our applications. But when the users saw that dashboard and more dashboards like that, they wanted more and more of it. Our sales leaders were asking us, can you give us now by product? Can you give us the various categories trending by year? So here you can see a report where you can see the ma a master detailed relationship again, but then you can see all the sales categories. You can see the numbers running across the, uh, as January, February, March by, by month there. And if you go into the second tab here, you can see this one's by product. And actually, Valerie gave me the spreadsheet. <laughs> this one's a much skinnier spreadsheet than what she had given me. When she gave it to me, there were like many, many tabs, many, many products, <laughs> all kinds of categories, broken down by segment, broken down by sales categories, quarter to date, year to date, month to date, every possible combination permutation that you can think of were in these spreadsheets. I don't know, and the graphs, of course. And then, I don't know about you, but when I saw this, I was really intimidated. I was like, how are we going to show all this information on one page? You don't want to build separate pages because nobody's going to go, oh, I want to look at this, so let me go to this page or that page. We, don't, we can't do that, so it has to all be in one page. So how do we do that? So what we did is we stared at it for some time, and um, then we realized <laughs> that these are nothing but matrix reports. They have a pattern. All of them have a pattern. So if you look at these tabs here, let's, let's look at one of them here, this master detail relationships. You can see that 
Okay, so you can see that the master table has one down grouping, one across grouping. And the detailed relationship, they all have two down groupings, one across groupings, so matrix reports. And these down groupings can be anything. They can be manager, they can be director, they can be region, they can be segment, they can be sales categories, the across grouping can be months, they can be quarters, they can be anything. So we went ahead and built a whole bunch of reports that would match these spreadsheets. And then using a reporting API, we read, we read these reports and match the data together and display them on the screen. So let's say you want a sales region, um, ca sales category report. Then you would read about four or five of the sales category reports, mash the data together, and display it on your Visual Force page, including the labels that are, going, that are down groupings and across groupings are coming from the report. So the code itself is very light. It doesn't have much intelligence. All it knows is that if I want, if I want sales category reports, I'm going to read these five reports. If I want segment reports, I'm going to read these four reports, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at this in our sandbox to see how this report actually looks like. So it's getting chopped off there, but you, you can see the point here. Yeah. There's a master detailed relationship. So you can see the, this one's broken down by sales categories, and you can see the January, February, March going across, and then you can see the sales categories down there in the detail section as well. And those links that you see there, they're actually links to actual reports in Salesforce. So they, you can go into those reports, dig deeper, and get down to the opportunity level. So now how are we actually reading these reports and storing the information and displaying that information? So there's about three to five reports that make up this particular page that you're looking at. So this is where it gets tricky. So I'm going to try and articulate this to the best that I can. So we store all this data in, um, in maps. So if you look at that detailed grouping there, so we would read a report that region name would be stored in a map as a key, and the value would be yet another map, an inner map. And the key to the inner map would be the sub-down grouping that you see there with the sales categories, and the value would be yet another map, which is the innermost map. And the key to that would be the labels that go across, in this case, January, February. And the value would be that dollar amount that you see there stored as an object. So we have these three layers of maps storing these values in these maps as we are reading these reports, mashing up the data. And then when you come to the Visual Force page, all we are doing is iterating through this map and displaying the data from these maps. So here, if you look at this, the master report that you see here is actually the report that it's reading. Here's an example report. So you can see how complex these business rules are. The filters are in the report. And then you can see here, for example, the sales for January is $4.7 million. So if you go up here, sales, um, sorry, sales for January going up to the master, sales for January is $4.7 million. So that's all it's doing, reading these reports and displaying the data on your screen. And up here is a chart right now. It's, I need to refresh it for you to see it. But it's just one image tag that's coming from the report as well, which is this tag, this image that you see here. So when we refresh it, that's the image that you would see there. And up here is a filter section. So this is where this filter section is pretty intelligent. So if you pick the drop down, so that. So that filter section is actually pretty intelligent. So if you pick that drop down, gross versus net, it knows which other reports to read. It knows that, okay, now I'm not going to read these five reports, but I'm going to read these other four reports. So let's take a look at the code to see how it works. So here are some code snippets. So here's the um, image tag that I was talking to you about. It's just one image tag. 
the report ID is passed on to the image tag. And then you can see you're reading the reports. This was built using the Apex reporting API, because this was built after the Spring 14 release. So to get the down groupings, you'd say get groupings down. And then it's as simple as that. So you'd use the report's namespace, use the report manager, run the report passing in the report ID, get down groupings, get across groupings, and get the fact map. So it's so much more easier than the REST API. So you can see it's just methods that we're reading. And here's that hash, that, that map that I was talking to you about, the three maps. So you can see how we're actually populating these maps. So you can see the three for loops. The first loop there, you can see the down group list. And then you would further get the sub down groupings by going through the down group list and say, and say get groupings again. And then you would loop through that. And then you would loop through the across group list. And then you get an access to the fact map. And then you'd say, down group across, sorry, down group underscore sub down group bang across group list. And then you would get that out of the fact map as an object, cast that to a decimal so you can actually use that and store that in an object called display data. Display data is actually an inner class in our code. And you can see there, it's, he's actually pretty intelligent, that class. It knows how to calculate percent to quota. It knows how to style the links. And this, so we iterate through the map, reading the display data and displaying the data onto the screen. And then the three group, uh, the three maps that you're, we, we are talking, we talked about are down there where we start populating them from the innermost map all the way to the outermost map. So, in conclusion, I'd like to stress that the business logic actually resides in our report. The code itself is very light. So modifying the report modifies the application. Like I mentioned before, it took 1% less than three weeks to actually build this and make this production ready. It's really easy and fast to build and maintain. And Arun talked about the reporting API limitations, but just be aware of that. Don't use this reporting API for a high traffic application where you're constantly hitting the reporting limits, because you could pretty quickly hit the remote reporting API limits. And then here are some useful links that um, I've used to build these applications and also to build this presentation. So thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope this presentation was useful. I'm going to hand this over to Arun for some closing remarks. Uh, thanks, Kotai. That was. That was amazing. It was a very well detailed description of uh, your use case. Um, so I think we finished early. If you guys have questions, please um, come up to the mic. You can ask the questions or come over and talk to us. Thank you. <laughs>